And welcome back to the History Show on Uxbridge FM. And it's a Ken Pierce talk once again, and we're hearing part two of the Uxbridge Moor talk. Here's Ken. Hello, thank you. Yes, um, this time I'm reading the reminiscences of a man called Charles Scaresbrook, who was born in Cowley Mill Road in 1901. So these memories are really just before the First World War. He does hop about from subject to subject, but I hope uh, it, it makes reasonable sense put all together. One of my grandfathers was a boat builder for the canal firm of Fellows Morton and Clayton. But my other grandfather was a ploughman who won lots of certificates for ploughing. Down on the moor, people used to put things in pawn, and us kids often got the job of taking their bundles to the pawn shop wrapped up in a cloth. A man's Sunday suit, for example, was often in pawn from Monday until Saturday. And then people got paid about four o'clock on a Saturday afternoon and they went up to the pawn shop to redeem their belongings. So the Sunday suit was ready for Sunday morning. The shops stayed open late on Saturdays while people had money to spend. When I was a boy, there wasn't a great choice of jobs when we left school. You either became a boot boy in service, or you went to work at Low and Shoyer's Flower Nursery, although things began to change after the Steel Barrel Company came. I was always top of my class at school, except for one occasion when I took half a day off to go to a circus, and I'm sure they deliberately made me second that term. I used to make a penny or tuppence taking people's coal from Fellows Morton and Clayton Coal Yard. I used to borrow their trolley and wheel the sacks round to people's houses. The best coal in those days was sevenpence a half hundredweight. The cheapest coal we called cobbles. Every Christmas, St John's Church gave the poor people of the parish half a hundredweight of coal each. My first wage was two and sixpence a week. So I, got, I handed my mother two shillings and kept the rest. But you could get a lot for sixpence in those days. Five woodbines cost a penny. That's uh, cigarettes, of course. You could get into the pictures for a penny. At the fish and chip shop, you could get a good meal for a penny. We used to ask for a, a ha'porth and a ha'porth. At Wingrove's stall in the market house, you could get a sausage and bread for a penny. We used to smother it in sauce, and it was as good as a feast. When I left school, I got a job at Woodlands. That's Lord Curzon's house then, off Chandler's Hill. I had to get up at half past five in the morning, muck out the horse, harness it to a float every day, and took fresh eggs, milk and butter to Vine Street Station in Uxbridge, from where it was taken to Lord Curzon's house in London. So every day his London property received fresh eggs, milk and butter from the Buckinghamshire land. I also worked on Lord Curzon's estate, removing tufts of grass from the fields. Fields, you notice. Grass verges were kept immaculate and a water cart toured the drives in dry weather, settling the dust. But in those days, only rich people had lawns and grass. Poor people grew vegetables and kept hens, pigs and geese. 
Many people had linnets in tiny cages, and there were singing competitions in local pubs. Do you remember the old music hall song? I followed the van uh, and um, ca carried um, the bird. And my old man said, follow the van and don't dilly-dally on the way, <laughs> etc. The Sunday walk was something of a tradition in those days. There was nothing else to do, although some people gambled in groups along the river between Uxbridge and Cowley. I sometimes caught minnows in the Colne and Uxbridge Moor and sold them to fishermen for live bait. A jam jar was lowered onto the river bed and left for a few seconds, and it quickly pulled out and it would contain two or three. The water was clear in those days. You wouldn't think twice about drinking it. Another way of making money was to collect a tray of bread rolls from Mutters the Bakers in Cowley Road about five o'clock in the morning and go and sell to the workmen at the Low and Shoyer Nursery. Labouring people generally took their midday meal to work in a red spotted handkerchief. Top of a loaf, a hunk of cheese and an onion. We always had cottage loaves with a top and a bottom. I used to go up to a soup kitchen run by a charity in Belmont Road for a bread roll and some soup at midday. Well, one day me and another boy took two rolls and when we got back to our school in the afternoon, Someone told on us. I expected a belting when the master called us out, but instead he asked me what I'd had for breakfast. And when I told him, he said, you poor little devil, and sent me out to get the top of a loaf and a penny with a cheese. And when I got back, he told me to take it to the cloakroom and eat it. Near us in Kelly Mill Road, lived Jack Serasalo, an Italian. In the week, he played a barrel organ round Uxbridge, stopping in front of shops and pubs for a copper or two. And at the weekend, he sold homemade ice cream from a barrow. There were plenty of tramps or vagrants about in those days, always begging for a can of hot water or a bit of tea. I think they came from the local workhouse. As a young man, my Uncle Harry lived rough. If he got drunk, he'd sleep all night in a ditch. He's a, he was a tall man who'd once been in the army and a real rough character. And then when he got into his sixties, he married a woman much younger than himself and settled down. I felt sorry when they had a daughter because I thought her father would die while she was still young but in fact he lived to be 95 and to become a grandfather. My Uncle Harry used to give me tuppence to clean his boots. I used to clean my father's boots too, but he never gave me anything, and he was never satisfied either. Take them back and put some more elbow into them, was his usual reply. But then children in those days often went in fear if, of their parents. If someone said to me, here comes your father, I'd run for it. The police dealt at once with mischief makers and a cuff round the ear from a rolled up cape really hurt. There were nine boys and one girl in our family, so we boys often slept four in a bed or sometimes slept out in someone else's house. I can remember some of our boys sleeping out and other girls coming in to sleep with my sister Mabel. But then big families were the order of the day. A married woman was either pregnant or just had a baby. 
In our family, a new baby came roughly every two years, so 10 was a fairly usual number. Stocks as good as money, people used to say. It was a struggle, of course, while the children were small, but people reaped the benefit when their true children grew up, began work and earning. Charles ends with um, a statement. I don't know whether you would agree with it, but this is what he said. In the old days, there were things worth buying, but we hadn't got the money. Now we got the money, there's nothing worth buying. Think on these things. Okay. Yeah, very true. Thanks, Ken. <laughs> different times, eh? Very different times. Yes, indeed, yes. <laughs> but, you know, as I said, people worked together and helped one another. That was that. And yeah. Charlie actually had a nickname, uh, Waggle. I don't know where that came from. Ah. <laughs> but I have suspicion that nicknames were very much more common uh, in those days than they are today. Oh, yes, for sure. Oh. Yeah. No, I have a feeling that nicknames have almost disappeared, except perhaps in sports teams. Yeah. You know, where people spend a lot of time together, or in the military. Yeah. Exactly. Where possibly and uh, nicknames survive, but in ordinary day, I, I don't know whether teachers ha have nicknames either. Mm. I, when I was at school, almost every teacher had a nickname. <laughs> <laughs> we won't ask what yours was. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I think I escaped somehow or other. Okay. But um, I, 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 I may be wrong there. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, I'm not aware of I had one as a teacher. No, no. no. Well, thanks, Ken. We'll, we'll catch up again in a month or so's time, I guess. That's great hearing about the history of Uxbridge and some interesting stories from a, another time, as we say. Yes, indeed.